Welcome, everyone, to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. Uh, for those of you guys who are tuning in for the first time, we actually do this uh, every other week where we, we invite speakers to talk about a variety of different topics pertaining to commercial real estate. And today we have the honor and privilege of having Blaine Stricklick, Stricklin on the call. Uh, Blaine is someone that I've looked up to for quite some time. I actually read both Thrive and Adapt uh, right when I got into the business, and it's been a very impactful uh, it's been very impactful to say the least. And so I'm really excited to kind of touch on some topics today that uh, are kind of center around some of the ideas of those books in particular. So Blaine, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So to start off, uh, for those for those individuals who are tuning in that maybe don't know about your background, if you could kind of share a little bit about your backstory, I think that'd be great. Okay. Um, well, I'm a lifetime commercial real estate guy. I, uh, my father was an Air Force officer. He retired um, when he was 44 years old and after being a fighter pilot in Vietnam and said, you know, I want to do something different. So he decided that he was going, going to go into the commercial real estate business uh, when I was a sophomore in college. So transferred to the University of Florida because it was one of the few schools that had a commercial real estate, pro a real estate program in those days. Today, many schools do. Um, back then, it was one of the few. And I had a mentor there. He persuaded me to get a master's degree. So I spent three years at Florida and came out with real estate degrees, which was pretty unusual even back in those days. Uh, even today, many of us don't have commercial real estate degrees. We've come from other arenas to come into commercial real estate. But uh, that led me to be the first guy hired by CBRE when they opened in Tampa, January 1, 1982. Spent 10 years with CBRE and then decided that I wanted to be a developer. So I spent 10 years learning the development trade by working with big development firms, got to work on some really cool big projects. That led to the third decade in which I acted as a developer myself. I syndicated my projects, which meant that I had to find the opportunity and then fund them. And that was a matter of raising equity and borrowing money. And I figured that out. And then uh, January 1, 2012 really started the fourth decade of my career. And at that point, I decided that I would uh, become a coach. So really, since then, I have focused on um, coaching top producers in the commercial real estate brokerage arena. Most of my work is with commercial real estate agents, but sometimes it flows out into agencies. Sometimes it flows out into allies. I do a little work for one of the construction companies that one of the agents uses. I do some work for an accounting firm, et cetera. Uh, much of that work is oriented toward business planning, hiring, uh, strategic direction, some of those things. Um, so today um, I work out of my home. Welcome to, work, welcome to World Headquarters. Mm -hmm and um, spend a lot of time um, really in one-on-one -on -one coaching with top producers. My goal has always been to be bespoke, which is to try to figure out um, how I can help you, how we can move the needle that you want to move. Um, so that makes me a little bit different than some of the other coaching organizations. I'm big fans of theirs. I send a lot of people to them, but my job is really to help a small number of people uh, really make very significant progress. Absolutely. And, and, you know, you, you, you'd mentioned the, the, the coaching decade of your life and you've also been involved on, on the professorship. So you, you, you teach at, at universities and, you know, I know some of the producers that you've worked with in the past, I mean, even Bo Beer we've had on the, on the podcast previously. And so obviously you've been a big giver to the industry and we obviously appreciate that uh, over the course of, of your career. Uh, you know, the reason why I thought this would be a good topic to discuss, um, and again, most of these, all these episodes are topic centric. Uh, you know, we, we find ourselves in a scenario whereby we've went through a, a, a pretty accelerated timeline of change over the last five years. Uh, and I would even argue more so than the last several decades, um, just through obviously technological advancement. We've had to contend with, you know, the pandemic, which is something we haven't really had to contend with for almost 100 years. And so, there's a lot of moving pieces uh, that have affected not only our industry, but other in industries as well. And so one of the things that I thought would, we'd kind of discuss is maybe over the last decade, what's, what are some of the changes that you've seen that are kind of relevant to what what's, what's we're facing today? And then as we get further along in this, in this discussion, uh, as far as the podcast is concerned, we'll kind of pick out little pieces and try to see uh, if we can find ways for, you know, agents and people really in the commercial real estate industry, because we attract people with this podcast from all across uh, the different verticals within the commercial real estate industry and some get some valuable nuggets out of it. So if I guess the main question to kind of round it back out is, you know, what are some of the more profound changes that you've seen happen over the last decade? 
Well, I'd like to actually expand that a little bit. Let me let me take you back uh, to, to when I got in the commercial real estate industry, and there I am at the University of Florida, and they have six professors. They uh, write the real estate laws for the for the state. Um, they're highly evolved as professors, authors, thinkers. And in those days, when you got a degree in real estate, there was one only one honorable thing to do, and that was to become an appraiser. There was nobody thinking about becoming a real estate agent back in those days. So I went to work for an, an appraiser in Tampa, and you know this is a long time highly regarded guy in in Tampa and uh you know you look at his sign and it said appraiser comma broker comma insurer in other words he was doing appraisals he was brokering and he was issuing casualty property and casualty insurance and that was the state of the art in the early 80s in Tampa Florida when I started at CBRE, um, it was revolutionary. Nobody had ever really heard of anything like this. And we spent the first year and a half in Tampa, Florida in 1982, converting the market to paying commissions up front. When we started, Raphael, it was like, yeah, you come by every month and pick up your commission check for that month of the lease term. So, so that's where we were way back then. Um, when I, when I went, as I was at CB for about four years, I was a producer. And then they said, hey, we only hire from within. And so now we want you to be a profit center manager. And so you're going to start out as the assistant manager in Tampa. And then they moved me down to Boca Raton slash Fort Lauderdale. And I ran a profit center there with 42 agents reporting to me. And in those days, the hiring profile was very strictly B2B. In other words, we went to Xerox and IBM, Lanier, HP, trying to find people and say to them, look, dude, you could be a copy salesman and continue to sell copy machines to the group of businesses that you call on. But you know, you have a quota every year. You can't make that much. Come on over here. We have unlimited earnings. We have no quota. And uh, that's, that worked. I mean, that's the way that CB was built in those days. Um, and um, I remember that we had pushes back in those days, like, hey, you have got to find more diversity on your staff. You have to find women. We couldn't find any women. We, we couldn't find any minorities for a couple of reasons, I think. Number one, the, the minorities that were starting to, to move up in the educational chain were saying, wait, I'm not getting a college degree and becoming a real estate broker. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to change the world. And so uh, the most profound change over this long period of time that I've been has been the increase in diversity. Not that we're all that diverse. But compared to the complete old white guy world that we were and have been for many, many years, Exhibit A, um, everybody looks like me now, um, or you know, my generation is still there, and yet now um, you start to see many more women, many more um, uh, people that have come from other countries, more um, minorities, or what would be classically uh, qualified or categorized as minorities starting to to be integrated. So, so number one, um, thankfully, we began to become more diverse, which of course just brings more uh, creativity, more collaboration, spreads us into markets that we haven't been in before, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I would say that's one of the biggest things that I've noticed through the years. Um, the second thing that is happening is an age span that is changing rapidly. So about five years ago, um, the National Association of Realtors did a study and came out with the result that when you specify just the commercial members of the National Association of Realtors, so SIORs and CCIMs would be people who hold designee, designations that are controlled by the National Association of Realtors, um, they announced that the average age of a commercial real estate agent in the United States was 60 years old. And if you look at the demographics of the SOIRs and the CCIMs in America today, not that hard to disagree with. But I want you to think for a moment, if I told you to go out and assemble a group of 100 people whose average age was 60, then you could say to yourself, well, well I'll have to get 50 people who are 40 and 50 people who are 80, and then the average age would be 60. So the second kind of issue that we've had to face is that there are a tremendous number of baby boomers in the commercial real estate brokerage arena, many of whom are aging out in, in different ways. In some ways, the baby boomers have been the beneficiaries of this long 
uptick that we've had and they've made a bunch of money. They own investment properties. Um, they may still be associated, but they're independent contractors and they're like, eh, I'm not really that interested in taking on a protege. I'm not really focused on that. Um, I'm doing my own thing. I don't really want to come to meetings. Um, I was working out of my house before COVID. This is the kind of thing you hear from older people who have sort of done their thing. So I would tell you that the, the very uh, slow to change age differentiation is starting to change as well. Um, that's been interesting to watch, of course, because um, uh, you know handling something on your phone is native to you. And it's like, I'm like, where's the button? Um, how do I log in? So there's an age issue that I think is starting to change as well. And then finally, you could certainly talk about technology in general um, that, you know, people forget that the iPhone's only 20 years old. I remember when I started, um, this appraiser that I worked for in the early 80s had a phone in his car and it was like a police phone, it had that big whip antenna and and you had to, it was, the thing was like a small suitcase, you had to pick it up and then you had to dial zero to connect to a, a, a transmitting up operator and they would dial for you and that's how you would click in. So technology obviously has changed in general, but I think one of the most significant factors that is radically different than when I started, um, when I started, CBRE had a big, a big extreme advantage because we dedicated people to go study the market and collect the data. And so for the first 10 years of my career at CBRE, we're the only ones that had the data. We, we, were, we were distinct because we were the only one. I was the first human in mankind history to ever pronounce the vacancy rate for the territory to which I was assigned. That's just 1980. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, everyone has that data because it's collected by broad agencies, the co-stars of the world, Rionomy, Crexy, whatever it is, and everybody can subscribe to that. So now, the, it used to be that we were dominant because we had the data. Now, you have to be dominant by how you use the data. Everybody has the data, so how do you leverage that advantage? Okay, so big picture, I think first, um, diversity, second age, third technology with a specific focus on the idea that everybody has the data now, which didn't used to be the case. So those are three areas, I guess, of where there's been a lot of change. Yeah, for, no, most certainly. And, and I, and I got to test too, uh, obviously on, on the demographic side, you know, I, I come from a engineering background. I was actually in, in the technology space for five years before I got into brokerage. Obviously, the demographics there tend to be skew more on, on the younger side. And then when I broke into the, the commercial space, that was definitely one of the things I noticed. And I, I think one of the big reasons for that shift too over time is that it is, and, and you've talked about in your book uh, on on many occasions where it's it the 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 way that historically the 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 approach has been to train people has kind of been, hey, here's a phone book or figure out what you're going to want to do and and kind of get out there and generate your own business because it's kind of a you know, eat what you kill type of, of, of environment. And obviously in, in situations where you have the economics, at least to support yourself during those early years, so you can navigate those early waters and ultimately make it out on the other side. Because historically, you look at brokers that have been in the business for five, 10, 15 years, they're doing typically pretty well because they built the, the network, they built the relationships to be able to support themselves long term. But usually those first few years is where the culling of the herd occurs. And so Hopefully, you know, that, that's why I think the, the things that we're doing right now and the things that you do are as phenomenal is that you're opening up the gateway for information so that people can learn about the industry, understand what the value proposition is of the industry. And then hopefully, if they decide to, to pursue it, they maybe don't have direct support from a mentor. And hopefully they do find that because that's obviously one of the best things that you could possibly do uh, in your for your career, but also at least have some information available to them so that they can hopefully be in a better position than someone maybe 10 years before or 15 years before was uh, without this type of, of help. So um, obviously that's, that's great. And on the technology side, you know, I know in, in, in adapt, you, you referenced the CRE tech conference and various other, uh, you know, uh, places that you've gone to, to kind of learn about some of these technology companies. It's unbelievable, especially with the advent of AI and now how that's all going to be kind of accelerating the growth of these types of, of enterprises. So uh, very interesting stuff, and 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 I'm hopeful we can talk a little bit more about that uh, throughout this 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 uh, discussion. Um, but one thing I was kind of curious about, just just so you understand the the makeup of our audience, uh, you know, obviously we tend to skew a little bit younger in the commercial real estate space. You know, the if you look at the pod people who listen to podcasts, typically it's in that you know 20 to maybe 40 year old range, 
and a lot of brokers and a lot of early investors and developers listen to this podcast. Um, and so a lot of the, the things that they're thinking about is, okay, maybe I'm brand new to the business or maybe I'm just getting my legs in the business. And now I'm, I'm constantly having to shift and figure out ways to be able to reinvent myself or at least create a, a strong value proposition that the marketplace will stick with. So kind of what you had alluded to in some of your, your you know, in, in the adapt uh, book in particular, creating that value proposition. So, you know, I'm assuming there's probably pieces of utilizing technology to be able to provide that stronger value proposition or whatever other things that you could share. So I guess my question is, what are some of the ways that people can leverage these new technologies or whatever other uh, resources that are available to them to create a strong value proposition for their clients, thus being able to generate more business in the future? Well, that's a challenging question, uh, Raphael, and I'll mm -hmm. tell you why. Um, if, the, if you had asked me, so what is it that you think is broken in our industry? What is the kind of the most dangerous part of the way we do business now? I would tell you that the entry process is broken. It's badly, badly broken. Here's why. Um, I'm in Orlando, Florida. To become a commercial real estate agent in, in Florida, you have to live here for six months and then you have to pay $800 and take an educational course and pass that course. And then you pay another $200. Don't quote me on those numbers, but it's in that range. Maybe you're a thousand dollars in to getting your license. And as soon as you have a license, you can say, I'm in commercial real estate. So you got to be, I think, 18, maybe 21. You have to spend $800. You have to live in the state for six months. And then you're in commercial real estate. And so the first thing you have to acknowledge is that we have an extremely low barrier to entry. Anybody can, anybody can say they're in commercial real estate. So, that, so that's, that's number one. Number two, um, as I explain in the introduction to Thrive, which I recommend to your, to your audience because it explains how we got here, which is that we're now in a world where all of the agents are independent contractors. And if I said to you, why do you think the firms want to employ independent contractors, the, I think if you thought about it, the answer what most of the agency managers would tell you is, well, we don't want to, we don't want to pay for insurance and we don't want to deal with taxes. You know, we just pay you gross and you have to figure out your own health insurance and you have to pay your own taxes. But there's a deeper, darker secret there too, which is that, and we don't provide any training. In other words, we're trying to minimize our expenses and that's why, and we're going to make it up to you by giving you uh, much greater splits. When I started with CB, I think, don't quote me, but it was something like this, 50-50 to a million, and then it went to 55. And so what happens in today's world, what we're basically saying is, look, you're an independent contractor, we're going to start you at 50,000, then you'll have a 60 and a 70, maybe you'll get up to 75% in your waterfall, and you might get there by the time you've made $300,000 or some number like that. And so what's not being said is, and therefore we expect you to take care of your own training. So what happens is many, many agents enter the business and they are, there effectively is no training. Sometimes it's as, as harsh as, hey, we supply a desk and we have some videos for you to watch and uh, you know, we subscribe to CoStar and you should go from there. So they, the agent not only doesn't have a value proposition, they don't even have a target. They don't even have a lighthouse at, at which to aim. Um, some firms will say, well, you're going to be on John Smith's team. He's great. He's been around for 20 years and you're going to be part of his team. And of course, you start way down low on that team. And John's a little cagey about this whole thing, too, which is, are you going to stay? So if I spend a lot of effort on you, will you stay with the firm or will you go someplace else? If you learn, if you get too smart, will you compete with me? And so it's a it's a cannibalistic training system when you try to put these junior people on a team with a, with a more senior person. So, so then the idea comes up, it's like, hey, you know what we'll do, Raphael, is listen, we know that you currently have a job where you make $100,000 or you're just coming out of school and Wells Fargo has made you an offer to be a vice president for $55,000. So what we'll do is we'll give you $5,000 a month draw for the first year, um, which enables you to, to you know, survive that first dreadful year. But what's also not said is, or not said clearly is, well, but that's prepaid commission. So I've had people literally call me and say, Blaine, you need to come and help us. And I said, why? What's the problem? Well, we got Raphael. I said, what's the matter? And he said, well, he's been here for 10 months. He hasn't made a deal yet. And he currently owes the company $50,000 because 
um, when he make, starts to make commission, then he's going to have to pay back that $50,000 and we think he's going to quit. And I'd say, well, I think I probably would quit too, because now he's got a $50,000 hole that he's got to pay back. So he goes home and tells his spouse, hey, uh, don't worry, you know, um, I'm going to make a deal and I'm going to get in, in another three months and my share of that deal is $30,000. And then that the spouse goes, great. So then you'll only owe the company $20,000 when that's over. And so the point, the point I'm making is that in many cases, the way that agencies think that they're helping someone is saying, well, we'll give you draw to help you, you know, survive that first year. But it would be much more valuable to them to give them specific training so that they have something that they can rely on as opposed to saying, we still don't offer any training, but we're willing to afford money to you so that you can make it. We still don't give you any training. You still won't, won't be any smarter, but we'll help you get through it. Well, then what happens is, is of course, the person leaves and I say to the agency owner, are you going to pursue that guy? Because you just loaned him 50, 40, $60,000. You're going to pursue him? They're like, oh, no, he doesn't have any money anyway. I said, so you loaned him money with no collateral. You, you didn't give him a business plan that gave him a pathway to get out. And I, I'm sure some people are thinking, well, this guy's old and he's a downer, et cetera. But all I can tell you is that I was having this conversation with Bo Beery the other day. I think you're aware that we've created these mastermind groups that last for one year in which Bo teaches you his exact methods. So we have 20 new people that come into that mastermind program on a yearly basis. And it's been breathtaking to both Bo and I how little they know. I mean, we really have to start at ground zero. They don't know how to get the information they need. They don't know what information they need. They don't know how to leverage that information. They don't really know how to develop a relationship through a calling program. So, so the first thing I just want to say in terms of your question about how can we develop a value proposition is that, honestly, I think you're going to have to take matters into your own hands, realizing that you're not going to get the training from your agency. You're going to have to figure out how to do that on your own. And, and in my day, we would have said, well, that's why we agreed to 50-50, because we were laden with training directors. Now, we just say, we don't have those, but we'll give you a greater split. And what got lost is that, yes, you get 60 or 70% of the split, but you don't get any training. And, you, and it got lost in the in translation that you need to spend 20% of what you make on training, whether you, you know, regardless of how you choose to do that. Okay, so let's get to value proposition. Um, the story I sometimes tell is that when I first started out as an appraiser, um, you know, I'm 22 or 23 years old, and I go knock on this guy's door, and I'm say, hey, I'm here to do the appraisal of your house. And uh, he, he grudgingly lets me in and has his arms crossed and is very standoffish and finally says, you're only 23 years old. You don't even own a house. How would you be able to appraise my house? And I'm like, well, first of all, you're right. I don't own a house. But what I think you might miss here is there's no one smarter about your neighborhood than me. And he goes like, what do you mean? And I said, well, did you know the house two doors down sold for $137,000 last month? No. Did you, did you know that that was sold on a easy financing terms, which probably inflated the value? Did you know that there's three other houses in this marketplace that are currently listed that indicate a value of this for your house? And so he realized that then what made me valuable, even though I was only 23 years old and didn't own a house like he did and had been paying mortgages for years, is that I had control of the data. So when I work with people that are just getting started, I said, look, the whole secret to value proposition is you have to be the expert in something. You have to, be, you have to draw a circle in some way and be discriminating. And what I mean by that is you care everything about what's inside the circle and nothing about what's outside the circle. So what happens is you become an expert in a designated niche. Now that niche might be asset class. I only work on suburban office buildings. It could be that you uh, focus on geography. I work on commercial properties between 2 million and 10 million that are in the Western Valley. Or it could be that you uh, focus by both of those. In other words, in the big urban areas, you'll have people that say things like, well, I only work on refrigerated industrial space that is rail served and is in the Northwest industrial district. And, and all of that is to say that you define this territory that you care about in such a way that there's economic viability. And what I mean by that is if there is economic viability that you can make a living inside that circle, then you become an expert and then you just get your share of the churn that occurs already in that circle. 
if the churn isn't big enough, then you don't have economic viability and you're going to have to do something different, make your circle bigger, whatever it is. But ideally for me, there would be 300 transactions a year that are inside your circle and your job is to get your share. And what I mean by that is if you've got a 3% market share, then you would have nine transactions. And if you make $50,000 per transaction, nine times 50 is $450,000. And that's the start. That's what we're aiming at. But it all begins with creating a circle that envelops economic viability and then becoming an expert. There's, you can, we can talk AI, we can talk tools, but at the end of the day, the only value proposition that pays off is where there's underlying economic churn. What, what I'm saying is, if I say, wow, Raphael, you've made a million dollars a year in Louisville, Kentucky. Wow, was it luck? What, what, what was it? And in reality, you, what you'd end up saying is, no, it wasn't luck. There was a certain number of transactions that were going to occur every year in the area that I serve, whether I get out of bed or not. But since I decided to get out of bed, I decided to go get my share of the churn that was there. That's awesome. And, and you know, that's a that's a very unique point that needs to be said, because, you know, even in my instance, for example, uh, I, I haven't sometimes gone to that level of detail when it comes to the focus area, because you know, I, I work at a boutique brokerage, for example, and it's more of a general type of brokerage given the, the the size of the market that we're in. And so a lot of my early years is, was just kind of figure out to ways to find any type of deals. It didn't really matter what type of deals I was working on. And as now as I've started to get a little bit further on in my career, I'm in year four going into year five. Now I've started to really tailor my message and really focus in the retail space. Um, and so I've started really honing in on that. But even to that level of detail, uh, being able to access some of that information, would you typically re recommend people to, you know, kind of look at these different uh, repositories of data for like a CoStar or Crexy or some of these other places and see, you know, wh what type of transactions are occurring? Because all this information, I'm assuming, is somewhat readily available for people to see. And then you kind of backtrack into, you know, if I capture 5% of this market share or 3% or whatever that, that is for the size of the market that you're in. I mean, is that t typically what you'd recommend people to do when they're getting started? Well, the my recommendation would be that the the more you're willing to discriminate, the narrower you make your sieve, the quicker it'll pay off. All of the top producers that I work with are extreme experts in a relatively narrowly defined arena, number one. Number two, um, somebody said this to me about six years ago, and I've never forgotten it. And, he, and we were talking about data and where he gets his data. And I said, well, do you guys like subscribe to CoStar? And he goes, <laughs> Blaine. Blame, blame, blame. I'm, I'm in a post co-star era. And what he meant by that was, you know, that if you polled everybody in the country and said, do you use co-star? Yes. And, and they, some proportion of them said, yes. You said, well, how accurate do you think it is? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Some people say 50. Some people say maybe as much as 70, but it's kind of in that range. And it's understandable in a way. For one thing, they use college students to collect the information. Number two, it's a fast changing market. Um, but what these experts do is that they begin to collect data because of the way they focus on these properties and they mow that same track of grass over and over, over, over and over and over. And their data that may have started with a co-star foundation, like here is the address of the building and here is the size of the building and, and here is the aerial photo of the building and everybody knows that Publix is located in that center. And that's what you kind of get from CoStar. But what happens is after you talk to the owner three, five, seven, ten 10 times over the course of two, four, seven, ten 10 years, you end up learning all kinds of things about the property that's not, that data is not anywhere else except in your CRM. And so what happens is it, one of the ways you can tell um, whether you're making progress is the extent to which your CRM data is getting better and better and better. In the early days, it might simply just be, I have one client and this is what we decided to do. We simply measured the amount of space it took up on his drive. So at the end of January, it took up eight meg, but at the end of March, it took up 11 meg. Can you see what's happening there? Which is that he's adding data into that, then the data is just getting bigger. So he literally was measuring, it was simply thinking about am I making a contribution to my CRM? Because if I am and I hold more and more and more information, I am on the path to becoming an expert. That's amazing. Great advice, other, really. Other people will say things like, well, um, 
I use real Nex, just X. I use X and it has a screen. And when that screen pops up, there's 40 fields on that and there's 20 fields that are already filled in. So I make it my job to fill in the other 20 fields. And then I've added 10 more user defined fields, which could be real estate related, such as have to be on the ground floor, have to be end cap, only grocery anchored. Um, must have 50,000 vehicles a day, whatever it might be. But mm-hmm. some of those, uh, Raphael, become personal. Like um, uh, you're thinking about entertainment. So for you, it's golf, horse racing, and bicycling. And they've gotten to the point where they're starting to say, hey, we're going to have an event and we'd love to have you come. And I'm thinking about getting a a booth or a box, or we're going to have a wine tasting. And they've begun to know whether the person prefers red wine or white wine. They're at that level. And that story about the red wine, white wine. And I asked the guy about that. And he goes, well, I'm a wine lover. I love to talk about wine. We have wine tasting events for our people, but I send out a a gift at the end of every year to about a hundred people. And I know who to send red wine to and who to send white wine to. So how do you like that value proposition? I mean that's yeah, and of, of course, and 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 I think that the the clear message here is that it's a it's a progressive process. It's not something that happens overnight. And and when we first get started, you know, you have limited data, but over time, as you start to have a regimen of being able to reach out to these individuals and really learning who these individuals are, the 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 product that you're 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 servicing, then obviously that's where the true value lies, and it's going to serve you well uh, long term, especially if it becomes a more of a habit when it comes to the the, the processes that you follow. Yeah, I'd like to give one little anecdote there that maybe mm-hmm. will help you think about this conversion and value proposition. So I was telling uh, one client about this idea of underlying economic viability and are there 300 transactions inside the circle that are going to happen no matter what? And, and you know, can you get your share? And basically he said, Blank, this is a small town. In order for me to get 300 transactions and draw a circle around my whole city, I'd have to draw a circle around my whole city to get 300 transactions. And then I would have to count every office deal, every industrial deal, every retail deal, five condominiums, six timeshares, and three lemonade stands just to get to 300. And I said, okay, well, then here's what we're going to do. We're going to make you the mayor, and we're going to get you a billboard. And then they say, this city, and they say real estate, then they're going to think of you. And we're going to, and we're going to, you know, we're going to, you're going to be on the Chamber of Commerce, and we're going to make you Mr. Small Town. And he listened to that, he goes, that sounds absolutely awful. And I said, well, how else are we going to get economic viability? And he says, I don't know. And I said, well, tell me, tell me the deals that you love the most and that you think have the most upside. And he goes, well, I've done some industrial deals along the interstate and this logistic space, this high cube, high volume space seems to be really interesting because the inter- our interstate intersects with another. And um, it appears that the companies that want to store goods along the interstates are really like this area. Well, to make a long story short, it turned out that if he went from his location 100 miles in any direction, now there's two interstates that act, so he's got these four legs. And so his territory today is 100 miles down each of these four legs, and there's enough industrial transactions just on those legs. So if you made me draw a picture, he would say, well, Blaine, the buildings are all within a mile of the interstate. So I literally have a market area that looks like an X. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and that just took time to really sit down and figure out, okay, what, what, where's the economically viable areas that I need to focus on? And ultimately from there, you, you create a plan of attack to move forward and, and become well, and that then, dominant and player. And then you start to get into second generation because you help Absolutely. them lease the space and then they yeah. renew or they buy or they buy and then they sell. And so mm-hmm. what happens by, as I call discriminating, and you stick with it and you become, first you become an expert where everybody believes you're the person that knows the most about X, that whatever fits inside this box. And then somewhere around the three year mark, you start to start picking up repeat business. And then by the time you're at 10 years, most of the people that I work with, their repeat business proportion is around 75%. Wow, that's amazing. And And so that's another way if I said to you, so you've said you've been in the business five years, and and I said, great, what proportion of your revenue flowed from repeat business? And you said 10%. And I said, great, what are your plans to make that 20% by the end of this year? Are you working back through the people that you've done work with? And you're like, 
Not really because it was all harem scarum and they just popped up out of nowhere and I don't really know where they were and I don't really know how I got them. And I said, well, there's an alternative to that business plan. That's amazing. Which, so, you know, which, so, which is to hunt them down, collect yeah. them, and then keep them collected and then figure out which wine they like and send them white wine and do their repeat business. That's amazing. No, really great advice. So, so kind of in that same vein, as we start kind of narrowing into that particular topic, you know, let's say that you are, you know, and, and you obviously you work with a lot of people across the country in a variety of different capacities, but let's say that you are working with Joe Schmo and he is a three year agent. And, you know, so far he's made his way in the business a little bit. Um, you know, he has a CRM, maybe he uses it, maybe he doesn't use it as much as he probably should. Um, he's, relying heavily on a lot of outreach and meeting people and networking and everything else. But as far as a, a narrowed plan of attack and leveraging certain technologies, because again, that's another piece of the puzzle, which I know you're probably very closely tied to, I guess, you know, what, what we've, we've focused on the areas that you want to have him focus on, meaning that he, he could do the analysis, figure out where exactly he's going to plant his flag. So he's going to look at the transactions in the marketplace He's going to focus on trying to attack that marketplace and really become an expert in that in that field. Uh, as far as the additional pieces are concerned, is there is there a strategy more so regarding outreach or is that just, you know, kind of just making contact and introducing yourself and saying you're going to be the expert and, you know, over time being able to provide some other form of value? Well, in the very first chapter of Thrive, which you mentioned, there's my mm -hmm. short six, 10 pages premise mm -hmm. of how I think you should start thinking about developing what I call the top 125 list. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that in order for someone to qualify to be on the top 125 list, they have to meet three criteria. The first is they have to be the decision maker. And by decision maker, I mean, they control the decision on a deal that you would like to do. So if you're tracking multifamily between 1 million and 5 million, you know that you're talking to Bill Jenkins Jr., who is the owner of Valencia Gardens and would be making the decision about what to do with this $1 million to $5 million event. Part of the reason I say it like that is because maybe maybe Bill's family's involved. Maybe, his, maybe he's the minority and his wife is the controlling entity, whatever it might be. It also distinguishes you from saying, well, yeah, I know this guy and he's a big shot in his company. And, you know, he told me that they're in a sublease space that expires in three months. And so he's going to need to find a different sublease space. And I said, well, the good news is, you know, who the decision maker is. The bad news is that's not a deal you want to do. So number one, are they decision maker on a deal that you would want to do if it if it got to that stage? Number two, are they willing to engage with you? So as you begin to try to build a relationship with you, are they open minded to that? What I would tell you is, is that first of all, the the bar is low. Most what most people believe about real estate agents is that it's all about the agent and they just want the transaction. And hi, my name is Kevin. The market is hot, hot, hot. Do you want to sell? There's lots of buyers in the market today. You could sell. Give me the, send me the send me the rent roll. So, so that's what we've done to them. And so for the most part, they become the first call. They're skeptical. You know, they're like, mm, what is it you're really proposing here? So. If you learn how to work with people in such a way that they're willing, then they, and you can tell whether they're willing to engage with you, that's criteria number two. Why chase something that's never going to happen? And then number three, you believe there's a transaction in the next five years. And the reason for that is you believe that they've owned it for seven years. Um, the market is changing rapidly. Uh, their financing expires. They've made a big uh, capital improvement two years ago, and they're trying to recover that. What, whatever they're aging, whatever might cause you as you're digging in to think that the transaction might happen in the next five years. So think about it, Raphael. What if I said to you, hey, dude, I have a list of 125 principals who are the decision makers. They're willing to engage with the right guy and the transaction is going to go down in the next five years. What would you pay me for that list? Seriously. Hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars because the value would be stated like this. Hey, Raphael, guess what's happening? Guess what's going on here, bud? I'm going to give you a list of 125 deals that are going to go down in your territory, in your corral, on your watch over the next five years. If it were straight line, that would be 25 deals per year for the next five years. Would you like a list like that? And so Absolutely. I just tell people, well, go, go develop it. Go, go develop it. Go create that that roster. And so when I put people up to that challenge, again, I'm repeating what's in the book. You can check this out. But mm -hmm. if you put people up to that challenge, 
I say, so the idea of top of mind is that they think of you first. In other words, what you, the way you're going to capture that business, or let me say it to you this way. If you had that list, Raphael, what would be a reasonable capture rate? Would it be just 10%? Would it be 40%? Would it be 80%? Because if you knew that, would you change your approach to those people to make sure that you had a top of mind mentality so that on the day that that deal pops up, and it's going to, that, that you're close at hand? Yeah, no, I, I would definitely change the way that I approach their the the reach out and, and obviously the things I send as far as value is concerned, just to kind of make sure that they understand that, I, you know, that I can provide the value of the transaction. So, you know, hopefully it would be much higher than 10%. So if you, if, knew three, in if, I, if, if you were a three-year agent and I was helping you with this, I'd say, hey, could we focus on this? Could you start giving some thought to this idea? And as you call people, um, they may or may not fit into that roster. In fact, maybe only 10% of the people that you talk to kind of fit into that roster. And, and, you, and you could say, well, how do I know if they're the decision maker? Well, how do I know if they're going to engage me? Well, how do I know if they're going to you know, sell in five years? Is it conceivable that we could make a mistake? Of course it is. But, but if we started down that path and said, did you, did you try to probe how the ownership works? Okay. And then you came to a conclusion, this probably fits. And then did you try to engage with them? Did you suggest to them that, hey, would it be valuable for me to call you again in 90 days and give you an update on the market? And he said, yes. Or you invited her to be your guest at an upcoming trade association, or maybe just simply to say hello at a, hey, are you going to that meeting? Could I stop by and say hello? And they said, yes. And you're like, okay, that's, Sneaky feels like maybe I'm engaging. And then the, is the transaction going to happen in five years? Who knows? But, but back to technology, you know, Rianomi now casts a vote on that. Did you know you can sort properties in Rianomi by whether they think it's going to sell or not? So maybe that's AI because they've come up with the algorithm that if it's owned by somebody who lives outside the country and they've owned it for more than seven years and it's in this zip code, then there's a high likelihood. So you could mm -hmm. be sciencey about that, but you could ask too. You could just, try to figure that out. So you get a list together like that. You start down that path. And, and I say to you, hey, I'm going to call you back in a month. And I want you to tell me how many people you got on that list. And you go, 11. I said, great. Then what we're going to do is we're going to focus on adding five or 10 or 15 people to that list every quarter to the point where you get up to 125. So that gives you the ability to self-measure. In other words, I'm sorry the bar is low and I'm sorry you didn't get any training. But if you glue yourself to that ascension that I'm going to have a, a top 125 list one, two, three years from now. And then I'm going to treat those people in such a way that I maintain a top of mind presence with them. One of the things I say in the book is that some people have turned that into a game. So if you and I had offices next to each other, one of the things we might do is say, look, let's see how many points we can post. Let's both put $50 in the pot. And you go, what do you mean? And it's like, well, if you leave a message for the person, you get one point because at least they heard your name before they deleted. If you talk to them, you get three points. If you talk to them in person, you get five points. And if you talk to them in person at the property, you get 10 points. So then what happens is I say, hey, Raphael, how did this past quarter go? And you go, well, I only end up with 23 people, but I scored 90 points. I go, great. I call you the next quarter. You say, well, how'd it go? You say, well, I added 10 people. So I have 33 people and I posted 140 points. And then I call you a year later and you go, well, I'm up to 83 people and I posted 300 points. I would say to you, Raphael, do you feel, do you understand what's happening here? You are earning money right now to be collected at a later date. Or to say it differently, there is no way you can post 300 points per quarter and not have that grow and blossom into deals at a, day, at a later date. So sometimes when I work with young people, I say, that's the, you're going to have to self-administer that, but that's where we're going. That's amazing. No. And, 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 and I think that kind of leads also to that, that idea of, you know, sometimes when, when, when you're used to being in a W2 job, for example, and there's a lot of people who've jumped into the space from other industries, you, you kind of have this constant justification or, or, or not necessarily justification, but a but acknowledgement of the work that you've performed over a period of time through a paycheck. And so, you know, I know that initially when I got in the business and you're working for months on a deal and all of a sudden it falls apart at the last minute, it feels like you have yet to, you know, really make us, uh, you know, any significant, you know, money in the industry or whatever else. What you don't realize is that obviously by making certain progress over time, you're paying yourself in the future. So you're just, you're creating, you're building that momentum and building that flywheel so that come, in the future, you can obviously benefit from it as well. So uh, kind of to your point about that, that's amazing. Um, well, I want to jump in there and just say, look, you know what? 
if I don't know what, so you were an engineer in a prior life. Yeah, what yeah, said? correct. What, yeah. Kind of, what kind of engineer? I was in mechanical engineering, then industrial, and then I got into software development. So perfect, perfect. But let's say that you decided to leave engineering, you decided to become a plumber. Mm -hmm. do, you have, do you know how long it takes to become a plumber or an electrician? Uh, you have to, you have to become like an apprentice and then you have to become a journeyman's like five to 10 years in. Right. I would assume. Right. Right. So instead you decided to get into, you decided to jump into commercial real estate where you're an independent contractor with no training and a very low bar. Mm -hmm. Do you, you feel the difference there? It's like, what, what, what did you think was going to happen? I mean, did you just think that, that just, yeah. <laughs> I'm now in, I'm in commercial real estate woohoo, and, and yeah. it's, you know, and, and it's going to work well. You know, you're right that what happens is people, it, it, you know, that first three years really determines whether you're going to stick or not. And it's it's not great because so many people get into it with that under with that kind of misunderstanding that, that this is going to go well. Here, here's another thing that you can listen for that I listen for. I talk to someone, go, hey, how you doing? Good, good. I said, well, what are you doing? I go, well, I work for Remax. Now, let me just say that again. I work for Remax. Tell me what you think you just heard. Um, well, I would say that it, it's a, you know, Remax is typically a residential firm. So, um, uh, okay. Yeah. But here's, here's my point, Raphael, is that yeah. first of all, you're an independent contractor. You, you don't mm -hmm. work for Remax. You're not an employee mm -hmm. of Remax yeah. at number one. So this whole thing, like they somehow owe me training, job, pay, vacations, benefits, you completely, you, you came in the wrong door. So I don't care whether it's, I'm not making fun of Remax or, anybody but anytime i hear an agent say i work for cbre i work for nai i work for lee and associates i work for jones and associates the first thing i would say is well you're going to have to back that up a little bit because first of all you're an independent contractor they don't see you as working for them they see you as one of their 20 associated agents from which they take in gross revenue payout split spend some money on expenses and make a profit running an agency. So first of all, you don't work for them. Second of all, you grossly overestimated their training program and their the business that they're going to generate for you. That's just not going to happen. What you have to think about is you are running Raphael, you are CEO of Raphael Enterprises, and you have chosen to buy a certain set of services from a platform. So you're running your small business on a platform. Think about it. If you changed, you would be saying, well, what I did is I changed platforms because I think the value proposition of this other platform benefits my business plan, the business plan that I came up with. So this idea of getting going to work in the commercial real estate world and thinking that the agency has somehow figured out what your business plan is going to be and train you toward that is, for the most part, just not true. Definitely. No, I couldn't agree more. So I'm not against agencies. I don't want you to take that wrong. No, I'm no. Just, I'm just no. saying people misunderstand what's happening here. Well, and oftentimes too, like if you go into it with that mindset, the, the the incorrect mindset, then you may be sorely mistaken and understand. And, and again, part kind of adds on to the the compounding effect of of potentially people washing out because they they, they have misunderstanding of what they're actually. Uh, you know, committing to or getting into. So that's right. And sometimes the best time to have the discussion is before you leave engineering and make the big mm -hmm. jump. Let's just take a moment and do a little compare and contrast to the world you're in now and the world you're going into. Yeah, 100%. All right. So what we'll go ahead and do, I wanted to leave a little bit of time at the end to be able to ask uh, questions as well. We have several people on the call right now. So if you guys have any questions in particular for Blaine, feel free to type away in the chat box and we'll get it added to uh, the video thread as well, so we can have people engage. Um, but in the meantime, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Blaine, do you have any questions in particular or any any topics that you're really focused on right now that you think could be of, of value to the audience? Well, um, you remember that uh, Thrive came out in early 2018, and the idea of Thrive was that, hey, I'm an old guy, I train people, and now I'm a coach, and here's how you can accelerate your business. And then one of my best friends said, you know, it's so funny you wrote that book because a lot of that guidance, Blaine, is historic. It's like 30 years old. You just wrote a book with 30-year-old guidance. I said, yeah, but it's still true. And he goes, well, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying it's 30 years old. So that caused me to start thinking about the future, which caused ADAPT to be written. And ADAPT is the idea of here's how I think things are going to change in the future. Um, and if I were to pick one chapter for a short moment like this, that I would encourage people to maybe take a look at is it's the chapter on the gig economy. And here's what I mean. 
today through Upwork and Fiverr and other places, you can find people that are extremely good at what they do. So as an example, if you decided you wanted to have a Gantt chart drawn for a project, <clears throat> you can go to Upwork. You can type in the word, Upwork is free to join as a, as a consumer. You type in Gantt chart and it immediately starts suggesting people that can do it. And then you go, wow, there's a lot of people here. And then you type in your specific job and you post the job. Like I am looking for a Gantt chart for tenant rep assignment to do this from, you know, over this period of time. And you get 10 people who want to do it and you can see their stars and you can see how much money they've earned. You can see what their testimonials are. Then you can have them respond specifically and all of a sudden you're like, wow, this is unbelievable. And it turns out that for $350, you can go through two or three iterations and get a perfect Gantt chart. But it even works at a lower level than that, which is if you simply had a flyer for a property, then one of the things that you might think about is, you know, the problem is that there's 10 of us here and we have one marketing person and she's fantastic. Jessica is world class. She knows a lot. But the problem is every time I go back to talk to Jessica, she's completely overwhelmed. And then there's that crazy Kevin who hangs out back there for some reason or another and is constantly distracting her and you can't get your stuff done. So you go to your manager and you go, Sandra, listen, um, I got an idea here. I want to go from 60% split to 70% split. And she goes, no way. And I, and, but just out of curiosity, why are you saying that? I go, well, here's the deal. I promise not to use Jessica anymore. So whatever I was paying for my split for Jessica, I'm not going to be doing that anymore. And she goes, well, how are you going to get your materials out? Well, I found someone on Upwork who cares about me, has five stars. I'm the top of the list. And they, they do unbelievable work. In fact, they do work for seven or eight agencies, and they're constantly at best practice level. So what I'm saying is I think the gig economy could potentially tear at the fabric of these agencies, the classic agency model, where it's like, well, Jessica, we pay Jessica $100,000 a year because that's what you have to pay to get that kind of talent. And you're like, great, I totally get that. I totally get that. And then what you're saying is you're effectively apportioning that $100,000 over the 10 agents, right? Because you're thinking they're going to make money and that's how we aggregate the $100,000 that we need to give to Jessica. So in effect, I'm getting $10,000 worth of Jessica's time pay because they're one of 10, et cetera. Well, when everything can become a la carte and super specialized, it begins to tear at the at what the agencies offer. Yeah, so that's amazing. Go ahead, I'm I, sorry. Well, in our own company, we have a VA. I can't tell you his name because I don't want to share it with you because I don't mm -hmm. want you to ever talk to him because he's fantastic. And um, my my point of that is, is that I can now get s very specific things done. Um, I'll give you a quick story. In Thrive, I say you have to have a pipeline report. If you have one, great. If you don't, read this book, page 87. It tells you where you can get the one that I recommend. I helped, I, de I developed it with a guy. We give it away for free. And so I have people now that are using that pipeline report, but using an external force, an external VA to help them keep that up to date and then constantly mine it for insight. In other words, over six years, they've put uh, 240 deals in there, and there's deal in, there's insight from just that data. Well, no one provides that at the agency level. There, there's no person that says, "Hey, could I work, could I sift that data with you and see what we're really learning from all the deals that you're doing?" And so, all I'm saying is, is that um, uh, what I'm most intrigued about is to see how the gig economy plays out in the commercial real estate arena. And yeah, of course. And how you how you yourself and if you're a leader of an organization like a brokerage, how you leverage the gig economy to, to amplify your 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 ge revenue generating activities. So that's amazing. Yeah. All right. So so, so we have a question here. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, what resources, books, podcasts, articles, videos would you recommend to someone like myself who had who has no prior experience commercial real estate, but is interested in one day potentially entering into the field. So um, I'm sure that you well, can provide two, two, two quick, two quick comments. This is the book thrive. I'm not trying yeah. to sell books. It's available no. hardcover, soft cover, audio book, Kindle. Mm -hmm. And if you go to, it's only a hundred pages, it takes you two and a half hours to read. But if you go to, 
Appendix C, there's 13 books here that say these, these are the books that have been meaningful to me. So you, I think that it's a, it's in Kindle uh, Unlimited, so you can get it mm -hmm. for free. You turn back to this page. Here's 13 books I think you should read. The second thing that you could do is you can go to goodreads.com. Goodreads is a subset of Amazon. You join for free. It doesn't cost anything. And then you friend me, and then you can see that I read 30 books a year. I post a review on every single book that I read. So when students would come up to me and go, well, what three books do you think I should read? I go, no, 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 Raphael. You go to Goodreads, you pick out the three that you like, and then we talk about those. So I've got reviews on, I don't know, 300 books inside Goodreads. You'll see I read a lot of different things. You may not care about the cookbook, but you may care about a book called uh, chatter or inside voice or atomic habits that I've just read in the last few months and how I feel about it. So uh, that's what I would do. I would say another thing that you could do, I think one of the best starting points is to take the CI 101 course. You can take it per in person, you can take it online, you can take it uh, as a self-directed. I highly encourage you, if you're just getting started, take the course live it will be in a market near you go to it take that 101 course and it will immerse you now you say but what if i don't pass the test it's like forget the test that you have to pass the test if you intend to get the designation but there is no better four-day immersion into the world of what commercial real estate is all about than that course so if you simply sit there and listen and interact with the students and try to work on the exercises that are in front of you it will be a huge um, um, determining factor for you. You will either be compelled to move forward or you'll be like, this isn't for me. Either outcome is good. So that would be my suggestion. That's awesome. Yeah. I, and I can attest to the CCIM uh, curriculum. I actually just got my CCIM last year um, in, in April. So it, it was game changing. It really helps you not only if you're a broker, but regardless of the industry, we had people in, in, in the classes that weren't brokers. We had, you know, agents. I mean, we had a uh, uh, bankers, lawyers, we all different types of people, obviously focused somewhat in the commercial real estate space. And some were just residential agents that had an interest in learning about the commercial real estate space so that they could maybe transition into it or just ex well, expand their knowledge into it. To that end, there's a course, a two day course called Foundations for Success in Commercial Real Estate. Take that course if you if you want to pay less or you only have two days. I do beg you to take it in person, though, because mm -hmm. then you get more chance to interact with other people who are different phases in the industry. You go to lunch, you talk to the instructor. Sometimes there's a cocktail party that's put on by some sponsor. So I really encourage you to do it in person. I want to make one more thing about CCIM. So I graduated from the University of Florida with undergraduate and graduate degrees in real estate, in real estate. And and seven years later, I earned my CCIM designation. Did I need a CCIM designation? No. Did I learn a lot of technical things that I didn't already know because I had that background? But I am so compelled by the CCIM program that I then became an instructor, was an instructor yeah. for 15 years. Now I'm an emeritus instructor. My father's a CCIM. My son is a CCIM. So we're in. Um, so even though I didn't have to have it, I believe in it deeply and I believe in it for you. Amazing. All right. So next question, uh, Erwin says, what CRM or other technology tools do you recommend for advanced CRE business? Um, well, there's a lot of CRMs out there. Um, we have customers that use, still use things like ACT. And then at the other end of the spectrum, they're into um, Salesforce, um, Apto, Realnext, Crexy, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the thing. So, Rafael, I'm going to put a little test question on it. Do you know how many functions Microsoft Excel has? I mean, unbelievable amounts. I, I, you know, I learn something new every time I use it almost. <laughs> so last time I Googled it, it said 470. Yeah. Now, how many do you use? Uh, not many, probably like 15 to 20. Perfect. So that's exactly what's going to happen. If I told you, hey, Raphael, I want you to go out this afternoon and buy a, buy a CRM. And so go listen to the sales pitch and get the demonstration, blah, blah, blah. Get the free subscription. They all have 500 functions. But the point of it is, is that you're going to be able to shop more effectively if you know what it is that you want and, and what you're going to use, because some of them do different things better than others. I, I was telling the story to a guy who goes, oh, I totally know what you mean. And I go, wow, that sounds pretty compelling. Can you explain that to me? He goes, well, here's the deal. When I go out and shop for a car, it's got to have air conditioned, not heated, air conditioned seats because it's 900 degrees here in Florida. And so if it doesn't have air conditioned seats, it's off the list. And, he, and I said, did that work? He goes, blame. It cuts it down to 15 cars. 
you, you get my point, which is that mm-hmm. if you determine how you're going to use it and think that through, you'll be a much better chooser of your CRM system. Great advice. All right. Well, we're running up right, pretty much right on the hour. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and we can uh, wrap it up. But Blaine, again, thank you so much for your time. We truly do appreciate it. And I know a lot of the audience members got a lot of value from this. We will we'll be distributing this in, in a YouTube format as well. And we'll be distributing it on podcast uh, as well. So if you guys are watching this on YouTube or listening to this in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever else, feel free to engage. And, and we'll make sure that if there, you have any other further questions, we're happy to be able to get those answered as well. So Again, Blaine, thanks so much for st- uh, for stopping by and sharing your insights with us. For those of you guys who are watching, please like and subscribe. It does make a huge impact in our ability to reach a broader audience and continue to come back, continue to engage. Uh, we do these every other week, and we greatly appreciate the support. So thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. See you.